famous Winston Parker. I joined the Royal Canadian Air Force in 1940 and uh, started my training in Canada. I trained here for quite a few months and I went overseas and arrived in England late May. My service number was 60366 and I trained at Cranwell uh, in England for my wireless. Then I went to Hershore up near Coventry for my OTU and uh, then went to 101 Squadron RAF at uh, Oakington. When the Canadians started to form their building, uh, their own squadrons, 419 was the first Canadian bomber squadron. Moose Fulton was the commanding officer who had quite a name for himself. And uh, Jimmy Payton and myself, both wireless air gunners, uh, were transferred to Mildenhall. And what date was that? I can't tell you the date it was, but uh, right after the Sean Harsh and Eisenhower and the Prince Organ went up the channel, they sneaked up the channel and beat the British pretty bad and got away with it. And my pilot got killed on that raid, but Jimmy Payton and I weren't in the crew that day. So, and so that's why we got transferred to the Canadian squadron. So the day you were shot down, where were you off to? Um, on April the 8th, we were detailed on the battle orders to go to Hamburg on the bombing raid. Uh, before we got to Hamburg, we got set on fire and uh, we were having lot, lots of trouble. So we tried to get back to England, but it wasn't to be. We'd thrown away our guns and everything and tried to fly on one motor, but we had to bail out of near Oldenburg, which is right close to Holland. It's the last uh, German area before you get to Holland. And uh, that was April the 9th. Uh, midnight had gone by with the time we were shot down. I hid out, got away for a few hours, but I got picked up by what was their home guard. I was hiding in a shed out in the field. I thought I might be able to make it, but they found me. And uh, we got sent, the whole crew was uh, gathered up except the rear gunner. And uh, somehow he got hung up, bailing out went down with the aircraft and it blew up before it hit the ground. Hmm. The rest of us went to do like looked and uh, the old interrogation station. And from there, our pilot was an officer and uh, he went to Salag Luft 3 and uh, the rest of us were NCOs, and Jimmy and I being the only uh, two Canadians. It wasn't very many days after we'd finished the Dulag Loaf before they loaded us in train cars. They weren't cattle cars, they had uh, seats in for about nine people, but they put 16 of us in. No, it was four days, five days it took us to get from do like look to Lambsdorff, which was in part of Germany. So how long were you in the camp? I was in there from then till 
wicked. In 1945, we started the march on the 22nd of January in 1945, and we had been on notice for several days. We've been able to hear the rumble in the distance of the German artillery. Okay. And uh, they were after some great tank battles and heavy artillery. And you could hear it from just a, a rumble away off to a closer rumble. And then it got so you could hear it was gunfire one thing or another. And then we were told to be on uh, a day's notice, mm -hmm. ready to pack and be, be gone. Yep. And then uh, they put it down to four hours. And then they put it down to two hours. And uh, one afternoon, or one morning, they said everybody to get uh, ready in the different compounds for 20 minutes notice. Okay. And they started, there was 26,000 men uh, attached to Stalla Gate B. And for days before the march started, They'd been bringing in chaps from working parties all over the area. They could get them away from the Russians and uh, get them where they were confined and the Germans could look after them. Mm -hmm. So we got so we were just bulging at the seams. Not only were we, every bed was full, but guys would sleep on the table, another guy would sleep under the table, guys slept on the floor, hmm. and we were just right full up. And uh, the water facilities were very low, and uh, we just waited till we find out what's going to happen to us. Finally, we got orders in our billet to out out on parade ground, and we're going. Mm -hmm. Well, part of what we'd done is we'd over the years you've collected a few things that we'd done in the person camp, uh, the odd book that you liked, and uh, different things. Mackenzie King had sent the Canadians in their a book to get artists do things in them, and we had all sorts of different artists that had done mm -hmm. memories of the camp or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, we'd all pack them. And, Books are pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the Russians were getting fairly close. And we started out, oh, late in the afternoon, we hit the road. And they put the people into 1,500 men to a column. And so many guards, I don't know how many guards, there maybe eight or 10. Mm -hmm. And you'd march out. And then they'd take another column, 1,500 men, same thing. You'd march out a different direction. Uh, we were heading west, but, uh, and for 26,000 men, there'd be 1,600 men that were either crippled or sick or mm -hmm. one thing or another, I'm sure. So uh, there'd be 12 or 14 columns, perhaps left 8B. Mm -hmm. And that was over a two day period. Or they just kept doing it till the, they emptied the, the camp, and we started out, and we really marched fast, and we did nearly 35 kilometers the first night, and uh, the weather wasn't too bad. It was chilly. When we started off, uh, the next day it snowed, and we had, I don't know, at least a foot of snow, but anyway, we uh, stopped, and we realized then that well, you can't pack this stuff. You saw Bibles and books and pictures, and everything being thrown. And uh, there was four of us that decided we're going to stick together, a chap named Hawkins and a chap named Mayhall and Dick Thornhill and myself. Mm -hmm. The other three boys are all English chaps myself we said we'll stick together and share and 
do whatever, and because we didn't think it was going to be a, a holiday march. We marched that fast day, and that day uh, when we stopped, we decided, okay, we're getting down to one blanket each, one change of socks each, and the clothes we wear, and uh, that's all you can do oh, to change underwear. Mm -hmm. And that was it. So the next day we we're marching a lot lighter. And we did a couple of days and the weather turned miserable. And uh, this one night I can remember, they put us in the gravel pit and it snowed in the night and it was cold. And I said to our chaps, take your boots off for sure. You put them inside your jacket so that they'll be thawed out in the morning. And I never thought of saying that, announcing it to other guys. Mm -hmm. But anyway, in the morning, we dug our shoes out from inside our jackets. And we just huddled together, the four of us, and put our blankets around us and each other for warmth. Yep. And that was it. And we didn't do too bad that way. But uh, in the morning, there was lots of guys that taken their boots off, just set them aside. They couldn't get them on. So they started out in bare feet till they could pull their boots out. And it wasn't long you saw guys with terrible blistered feet and having a pretty rough time. But uh, I saw a chap when that deep snow, we were walking along and the snow got deeper and deeper. We were walking along this and I saw a chap look around and throw himself into a snow drift. And does he want to just disappear? Or did he want to maybe go back to the Russians or what? Yep. I, I'll never know. But anyway, that was the first casualty I saw of the march. And that was four or five days into it. And we kept marching along and then Hawkins, an Englishman, he'd uh, been hit pretty bad with shrapnel when they were shot down. And he had pieces of shrapnel in his spine, small pieces. And every once in a while one would work loose. And it had happened a couple of times in the camp. And he went through agony while they were working loose and mm -hmm. it would, uh, fester and come out and then he was home free for a while. Hmm. Well, one of these pieces, I don't know whether the Martian and agitated or what, but it got working and he just couldn't go or so. We dropped him off at a, I don't know, the French or Dutch working party. Mm -hmm. And they said they would see he was all right. And uh, he got home, so they looked after him. Good. And uh, Dizzy Mayo uh, had been taking that to Brook. And he always said, I was the most peaceful person the Germans ever took. He said, we'd been working awful long hours at Benghazi mm -hmm. uh, and, and to Brook along that front. And uh, he said, uh, we we're just dead tired. And we got into to Brook and uh, we had the off for the night. Mm -hmm. Boy, he said, I was so tired. I just went to sleep and slept and slept. And he said, when I woke up and came out, it was all German guards around. The British had gone. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I didn't even behind. know it was a prisoner until I walked out. But anyway, now there's the three of us left and we decided to stick together. Dizzy Mayho and myself. And we stuck her out the, the, the whole trip together. And uh, I remember one of the, we never got billets a uh, single time, uh, but awful close once. Once we got put into an aerodrome that had been disbanded, uh, there was still some aircraft sitting there. So they had no fuel. Oh, and uh, the billets were empty. Mm -hmm. And we went into those villas one night and moved out first thing in the morning. Well, the villas were bare. There was no beds and things like that. And they had all been taken. It's just a 
but at least we were in a billet one night. Yeah. Out of the weather. But, uh, we used to get put into great big sheds. Uh, a lot of the villages, they did sort of a communal farming thing. They all lived in the village and then farmed from the village out. Oh, okay. They're different farms each way. And they'd have a big shed, a, a place for straw or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if we got one of those places, it was great. Uh, but you had dry straw to lay on and a roof over your head. But no food. And I remember stopping at one place one night and it was a big dairy there. Oh. And from the hay shed, you could see all these cows in there. And I watched till I got a chance and I sneaked out and built a cow in my oh. Dixie and had a good big drink of milk and then filled the Dixie up and I saw a guard look and they shoot you if they automatically shot if you're caught in a place like that. Mm -hmm. But then anyway, I lay down on the manger and pulled the cows and waited quite a while and then I peeked out and there was nobody around so I got my milk back into the camp without getting caught and hmm. my two buckets Muckles had a drink of milk each. Yeah. And there's another milk story coming later <laughs> on. And then one night, one of the worst places we ever stopped at, they put us in a brick kiln. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, to explain a brick kiln so that everybody understands it, a brick kiln has, it was two story, and the floor is plank with about an inch and a half space between the planks so that the air can get all around and dry the bricks. Yeah. And they can circulate air on these to dry them. And uh, when we came to this place, they divided us up and uh, we waited outside till we had some kind of a soup that they brought to us. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, divided us up and the first half were put in the top half. And I was in one of that, our group was one of that. And you went up an outside staircase and into a landing. The landing was through a door into the building. Mm -hmm. And there was a light there and a couple of half barrels for latrine. And okay, you fellas, you're there till, uh, tomorrow morning. Well, we got busy and moved bricks and Got a pad big enough for the three of us to sleep on, and guys were doing the same thing everywhere. And you could see the one light over the latrine and one window. Well, so happens in the night you got to go, and I moved. Uh, I could see this light and so on, and the whole place is full of bodies laying on the ground on the floor. Yeah. And I made it to the latrine, all right, and uh, started back. Gee, where, well, which way do I go? So I know I hollered, where are you, Thornhill? And he hollered back here when, so I was going to go that way for a while and then check. I knew it was quite a lot closer. Got back to my place. That was fine. And... Uh, we didn't do too bad up there, but the poor guys that were the second cut, they were on the ground floor. And we all had dysentery. Dysentery was the bugbear of the march. And uh, a lot of guys, they, they couldn't get to the screen. And the poor fellas down below, they got the benefit of the split floors and guys with dysentery above them. Some of them were pretty messy shape the next day. I thought it was the rottenest place that you could possibly put somebody. Mm. Anyway, we survived it. One of the things that happened early in the march was we marched just uh, past Dresden. And this is not late, but late mid-afternoon when we were just uh, coming up to where Dresden was, and it was three or four miles off to the left of us. And we were on a little back road, and we saw a bunch of British aircraft.
coming just like a flock of crows, not very high. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the Germans saw them, they threw us into a field and mounted a machine gun and told us we couldn't stand. We had to stay flat, but sit down and lay down mm -hmm. and uh, put us in this field. Well, that big flock of aircraft, they flew as to Dres over Dresden and nothing seemed to happen. And then there was another wave came and another wave came and they flew over Dresden and not too much happened. Then they were going away and Dresden started to blow up, delayed action. Oh, wow. Bombs. And she started to burn. They put lots of incendiaries there, I guess, but that doesn't explode like the mm -hmm. heavy bombs. And uh, for two or three days, we could see the glow in the sky from Dresden. It was a very controversial air raid, but uh, those that were anti rafts I'm, the, they said it should never have been bombed, but at the same time, any place the Germans had like that, they used that advantage to hide war material manufacturing. Oh, okay. So any place was a target to a point. Yeah. Anyway, we uh, walked on like past that, and like I say, we could see her burn for about three days. One day, Izzy was so sick, he had dysentery and he had a bug of some sort that he said, I can't go on anymore. Well, Dick and I split his load and took us each the side of him and kept him going. And by this time we were getting, instead of doing 20 kilometers and 25 kilometers, we were doing maybe eight or nine kilometers a day. So we stuck her out and the next day he was better and carried on. And a few days later, I was in the same boat and I just couldn't hack it. They did the same for me. When we left Lambsdorff, I've got a map here that uh, I'm going to show you. I marked it. I marked Lambsdorff here, and that's in Poland now, but it was in Germany. And then when the border was straightened at the end of the war, or made crooked or whatever, it got a Polish name. It's no, Lambsdorff is no more. And this green line that I bring through here, uh, we did march that straight, but that's the route we stayed, and all these names, I come to them, and we got to here. But then we're getting in pretty poor shape, and uh, I'll tell you an instant about poor shape when I get back onto the march. Now, from here to here, I see the odd name I recognize, so this is a guesstimate of just about the way we went. And we got up to here, uh, which is south of a town called Hildesheim. And I've got it marked one and two. We stopped here at a little village in here, uh, inside of this circle. And that's when General Patton's army came along and uh, released us. And that was the 11th of April. The, German, the Americans said, we've taken over 30 billets and uh, you fellows are safe. We'll have a few chaps on guard here tonight. Two minutes later, a sergeant came along and he said, we've got orders to move on. We're going to put a tank at each entrance to make sure you're safe. And he said, we're marching... We're advancing at 35 kilometers a day now. So they moved on. And the next day, oh, they, oh, the, one of the things he said was there's 30 empty houses up there. You fellas can sleep in them if you want. We've emptied them out. Anyway, while we were here, we went scrounging. And here's my milk story. I went to see what I could find and I walked a little piece into the country. And when I say a little piece, less than a hundred, a uh, quarter of a mile. Mm -hmm. And I came across a three gallon can 
and it was nearly full of milk. So, boy, I got a fine, but I was too weak to lift it and take it to camp. So I went back to camp and got Dick Thornhill, and he and I carried it back, and Together. we had a good drink of milk. That was the one thing that you really craved. It's easy on your stomach and mm -hmm. one thing or another. And a few other fellows got a good drink of milk, too. One of the things the Americans were so good to us, they gave us K rations. Some of them gave us K rations from themselves. They saw a terrible mm -hmm. hunger we'd been through, but those K rations were too strong. Boy, you ate some of that and it was so concentrated, it really griped you. Yeah, it, we couldn't handle it. And while we were there, the Americans told us to get ourselves into groups of six to 18 Canadians, 18 New Zealanders, 18 or whatever, Australians, mm -hmm. British for the, uh, the British Isles, and get yourselves organized, and we'll be picking you up with trucks pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Well, the first group of trucks, I think it was 18 trucks in it, and uh, they came in and they took the sickest and there were 18 trucks, and I missed the, second, the first 18, but a chap by the name of Brown, who was a fighter pilot, had been shot down in the Middle East, a Canadian. When he was out scrounging, he found a German truck that worked with wood alcohol, and it had some wood that they carried and a cylinder to make the wood alcohol in, and he got it started and brought into camp. So we got another 18, and I was at the cutoff for the sick guys, so I got in on the first bunch of and now we got an extra yep. truckload of Canadians. <laughs> and we went from there through a town called Hildesheim, is it? Uh, yes. And... Uh, when we got there, it had had a real bad raid just before, within a, a couple of days at least, maybe no more. The Americans had bulldozed the road through the town, and uh, they hadn't had time to do anything with it. We saw dead horses, dead cows, dead people, everything, just bulldozed the cars through the road. And they took us to a flat area three, four, five miles the other side of this mm -hmm. town and a nice flat spot. Which is where the number two is, right? And that's number two. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. We just waited not too long, we waited a little while. We were told to be ready and we see an aircraft coming in, then another one, then another one, and there was a long string of Dakotas, which was the Americans workhorse, flying ammunition, food, whatever, up to the front. And they picked us up and took us back to uh, General Patton's headquarters where they were set up to process us. I'll come to that later. Yeah. But anyway, this truck wouldn't start very good. And when the Americans got lined out, the guy on the last truck, he said to Brown, I'll throw out a tow rope every time we stop. You shut your truck off to save your fuel, and uh, I'll hook on you and pull you to start you. And then, so that's the way we got. So I came out on a stolen truck for that last little bit to there. Then they flew us to Nice, and that was his military headquarters. And they were all set up for us there. When we got there, first time it was to hear English, uh, girls speak English. And uh, it, but they were all American girls. They all spoke with a twang. Mm -hmm. but, but anyway, it was pretty good. And they gave us a razor and some soap and different things to clean up with. And then we went to a big tent and you stripped off completely. And they had things like vacuum cleaners in reverse. 
and this tent had six or eight uh, inches of a white powder on it. Hmm. And you got powder blown everywhere. In your ears, every place they could blow powder, they blew powder. Hmm. And then they gave us a little tin uh, to take just in case. And this was lost powder. And it would kill all the lice. <laughs> and we, when we were coming through, some Russians got thrown in with us for a while. Mm -hmm. And some Americans got thrown in with us for a while. 300 Americans. And they had it tough because they were used to riding on rubber tires and had the all the facilities. The American Army was great for looking after their soldiers. But when they got into immediate these tough times, it's all right to condition yourself, which we had the chance to be conditioned. Yeah. But they didn't. It hmm. hit the American palace pretty hard. But uh, and as soon as the Russians came. We noticed everybody was getting lousy. We were in bad shape anyway, mm. and we were so filthy. We hadn't bathed or anything, and we had dysentery. And, yep. and uh, a few days before we got released for General Patton, it was a beautiful day, and we came by across an irrigation canal, maybe 20 feet wide and two and a half feet deep, maybe two feet deep. And the Germans said, okay, we'll stay here this afternoon. You can just clean yourselves up. Boy, that was wonderful. We soaked our clothes. Instead of being hard, they were soft and mm -hmm. uh, cleaned up as best we could. And uh, when I left uh, 8B, a friend of mine who had marched in from Dunkirk and taken that Dunkirk had told me in 8B, I marched most of the way into here, Wynn, and he said, we likely will march out. Get yourself a good pair of boots when the Red Cross finally come to get us some. Get them broke in and save them. So I did that. Hmm. And I had a practically new boots the day we started the march, and they were a good heavy army boot. And when I finished the march, they were completely worn out. We, a lot of our marching was on cobblestone roads, and they're hard, especially on uh, wet leather. We march through rain, mm -hmm. and we march through snow, and that's yep. hard on them. So now we get cleaned up. Then the British sent aircraft and picked the Canadians up, and Bourne was our headquarters for the Canadian troops. So we got flown to Bourne. Other guys got flown to different, the New Zealand was at a different place. Yep. Just, that's why they put us all in, segregated in their own. Didn't want to have to sort you out later. You yeah. were already sorted. So anyway, we did that. And uh, I got, as soon as they saw me, they said, well, he's going to hospital. So they sent me in an ambulance to a hospital uh, just near London, a Canadian hospital. The name slips me right now. But anyway, I got there and uh, the nurse said, took me down to a place in the basement and ran a hot tub and the hot tub just sat out by itself. The old style we used to have with four legs and mm -hmm. fairly high. And uh, she said, you have your hot bath and then report to bed 40 something. When you get upstairs, this was a great long room with a row of beds down both sides. Yep. And uh, when she saw my boots, she said, can I have them for a souvenir? I was walking on my bare feet on the bottom. They'd worn right through. I just had calluses to walk on. And so I gave her my boots and uh, I had my bath. That was the last straw. I was so weak I couldn't get out of the tub. That's why they came and rescued me, <laughs> got me up to my bed. And when I got back to uh, England, the way I sit now, I'm about 198 or 200 pounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, my regular rate, the weight was 174, 176, something like that. Mm -hmm. And when I got to the 
hospital and they weighed me. I weighed 98 pounds. We were allowed to come home.